I'm Dr. Christine Dudgeon and I'm a research fellow at the University of the Sunshine Coast. So with this project, we're investigating uh, the connectivity on Lady Elliot Island between birds and nutrients and how this impacts the reef environment and also how is Lady Elliot Island connected to other parts of the Great Barrier Reef in southern Queensland. these trips we do a lot of different research so some of it starts on land where we go to different sites around the island we collect things like leaves and soil and leaf litter and do bird counts to try and understand which parts of the vegetation the birds are using on the island we also are very interested in bird poo we want to know how much nutrient they're contributing to the soil it's essentially like fertilizer and then we investigate how this impacts the reef so we go around in the reef flat and we take videos of different fish so we can calculate biomass and abundance. We take photos of the benthos so we can understand what the reef structure is made of and how healthy it is and then investigate nutrients through the food web. So we look at all different levels of uh, trophic levels in the food web starting with plankton, primary producers up to our herbivores and carnivores. <laughs> This is the lowest point on the island in here and um, that's the largest, the oldest sandpaper fig. Black noddies love nesting in the fig trees but they become white cap noddy or the black noddy uh, apartment buildings basically. They really like them. So this has our sights on it around the island that we can find all of the sites when we go looking for them. So we have uh, 36 sites around the island that we, that we need to find. Some of them are quite easy to find, others we do definitely need the GPS to locate them because they're fairly in fairly dense vegetation. So this is our uh, Figland 3 site that we call it. And so now we'll run out a 10 metre transect tape and that will give us a 20 metre diameter circle sampling location. <laughs> steps. Okay. So what we'll be doing here is collecting within these bags. So we go to three different sites within our point transect uh, location here and we'll collect the predominant vegetation type. So a few leaves off each of the predominant vegetation types. So that's for this bag. So if we have a look around we can see that this particular transect is dominated by this is sandpaper fig. You can feel how rough it is. Um, we also have a few pest species in here. So this is lantana. We can see it, it's got quite pretty flowers. The reason that there is lantana here on the island is because there was, um, when the settlers first came here and built the lighthouses, they planted lantana as part of their uh, gardens. Decorative. Yeah, decorative plants. So, and lantana is an incredibly hardy, pioneering plant. So anywhere there's disturbance, lantana will get in there. So we'll take a little bit of the lantana because it will use the nutrients of the, of the area as well. So we take these samples back to the lab and we dehydrate them there so to remove any moisture from them. So that's why we're on the island. And then once we're off island, uh, they all get crushed down in the laboratory and then analysed for stable isotope analysis so that we can follow that nutrient cycle from the island out to the reef. In the marine environment, uh, we also trying to understand how that change in vegetation and the nutrient input affects the trophic web. And we do this by examining nutrients through the trophic web, right beginning with our primary producers, so our uh, algae, microalgae and macroalgae, up to our top reef predators. And at low tide, when, when the water is very low, one of the top predators on the reef becomes the epaulette shark. It's a, cute little shark um, that might seem to not be necessarily a big predator but it is uh, in that system uh, during those low tide periods. Right, 
it. So we just grab it quickly from behind the head. These things can turn right around on themselves and, oh, don't do that. They're looking for things like small crabs and snails that they feed on. So at this time when it's low tide, they basically become the top predator on the reef. And that they are the top predator on the reef flat in low tide is because they have this physiological adaptation to be able to stay there. They can withstand very low oxygen levels and even no oxygen for a period of time. So that's why we can pick them up out of the water while we take photographs and measurements and take tissue samples from them. Uh, one of the other features which is quite uh, unique and interesting about them is that uh, they can walk on their little fins. So this is why they're also known as walking sharks. So if the water level's really low and they want to get across a bit of reef to another pool, they can get right up out of the water and just walk across a little bit of coral and find another pool to hop into. So we're taking a tissue sample from the end of the tail for this animal. So this sample will be used for isotope and genetic analysis. Um, and you can see that uh, they, they don't, they're not really vascularized in the tail, so there's actually no bleeding happening. And they also have very high uh, capacity to heal. But we will put a little bit of betadine on that um, just to help sterilize it before it goes back. Oh. It's an amazing place for nature. There are very few places like this where you can see the amount of biodiversity in the water and also on land with the seabirds um, in such close proximity. Being at the resort as well, we get to interact a lot with the guests when we're doing our research and most of the guests that come here are very interested uh, and really keen to know what we're doing to understand the environment better and that's a wonderful opportunity for us to, to share what we're doing and, and our knowledge and, um, and to hopefully inspire people to want to do more uh, with you know, what they can do to help the environment.